Hello, my name is Ross Langston. I work here at Windward Community College. I teach anatomy, but in the summertime, I'm a fish biologist. So we'll talk a little bit about fish and fishes. So what's the difference? Is, is fish or fishes correct? Well, as it turns out, they're both right. So we definitely use fish as the singular for one individual. We say that's one fish. For two individuals of the same kind, we say those two fish. And many individuals of the same kind, we say three fish. That's fine. But when we're talking about more than one species or more than one kind, we say these are multiple types of fishes. So here's one species. That's a manini. There's another one. That's Acanthurus guttatus, and that's Olivaceus. So we've got three different species in there. So we'd say that there's three species of fishes, and that's correct. Okay, in learning about the life cycle of fishes, I think this nephris module was geared towards freshwater fishes, which honestly, I'm not a big expert on. But I'll talk a little bit about the life cycle of what they want to go through, which is the life cycle, I think, of salmon and, and uh, things like trout. So salmon and trout tend to spawn up in streams, and we have our male and our female uh, salmon, and they lay their eggs, the female lays her eggs, the male fertilizes those eggs, and those eggs remain in this nest, which is called a red, and it's down to this big gravel bowl, and eventually those eggs hatch after about three months, and they become something called an alevin. An alevin is otherwise known as a yolk sac larvae. Uh, these guys don't have fins that are moving around really. They would kind of drift around if, if they weren't remaining down in the gravel. So they're hunkered down the gravel. They're subsisting off of just this yolk and the yolk sac there. So that's where they're getting their nutrition from. They're not eating anything. And then we go to the fry stage. Okay, fries are basically larvae that have lost their yolk sac. So they hang out there uh, for several weeks. Uh, they start to swim around a little bit. They get their ability to swim and eventually metamorphose into something called a par, which is just a juvenile fish. Uh, par and smolt are both juveniles. Uh, par uh, have these little lines going up and down. And then smolts uh, are a little bit larger, get up to a year old, and they voyage eventually into salt water where they're going to complete their life cycle, become adults, and those adults are eventually going to come back to freshwater spawn. So this is a classical sort of anadromous species, um, but it's not what happens in, in Hawaii or in salt water. So let's look at some examples here. So what stage do you think this would be? Yeah, this right here would be a yolk sac larvae, otherwise known as an alvin. So very good. Okay, what about this? Okay, these are adults, right? We've got the hook-nosed male and the female right there. And what about this? Okay, this guy right here is very, very small. It's not even the size of a finger yet. So it's not a fingerling. Uh, we're gonna probably say that it is a fry because it does not have a what? It is missing its yolk sac. So having a yolk sac makes it an alvin. Not having a yolk sac makes it a fry. So that's what we're gonna say is fry. Now, the question is, why are some young fish called fry? And this was one of the questions that Nephris had posted for me, and I honestly had no idea. So here's your possibilities. One, because juvenile fish are quite tasty if fried up with garlic butter. Uh, two, because the word fry is derived from Norse, meaning seed or offspring or three because they are the favorite fish of fry from Futurama. Which one is it? Well, if you said B, you are correct. In fact, fry comes from Old English or Norse meaning um, sea or offspring. And so it's, that's what it means. It just means seed or offspring. We actually used it for people at one point. I honestly thought it had to be A, but I was wrong. Um, years ago, we worked on a paper here in Hawaii on this convict surgeon fish. And in publishing the paper, uh, my colleague came up with this picture, which was taken about 100 years ago here in Hawaii. And this woman has a literal basket of fry uh, of these very uh, tiny uh, surgeon fish called manini. And this is what they look like, but they're only about the size, about like that. Uh, and so they would actually dry these out and eat them kind of like potato chips. And so that's why I thought, oh, it must be fry because we fry them up. But that's not in, case, uh, not in fact the case. But people still do eat fry, so I wasn't wrong. All right, coral reef fishes have a little bit different life cycle here. Um, instead of laying their eggs in the nest, most coral reef fishes actually have legs, uh, eggs that are pelagic. They're spawned up in the water column, and those eggs will develop there into larvae. And the larvae hang out in the water for about 30 days. And initially, the um, yolk sac larvae, what we would call the alevins, can't really swim around, so they're just kind of going where the water goes. Uh, but eventually they gain ability to move up and down and regulate where their movement is. And eventually as late larvae, they settle out on the reef to become juveniles. And during this process of settlement, they change their shape a lot 
from being kind of crazy looking to being kind of fish looking. So we call that process metamorphosis and settlement. Um, and you can see some of the different uh, progressions of fish development. So here's more of the juvenile stages down here of these two different surgeon fishes. But if you look in the larval stages, they're pretty crazy. You've got these big spines on them, no pigment. Um, why do you think they have spines? Spines sticking out, is it just a fashion statement? No, it's actually for protection. As it turns out, um, small little larval fish are good to eat. And so to help prevent some predation from other predators, they actually have these spines to, to deter predators. I don't know how effective they are. Okay, how, how do we know how old fish are and how long they spend in the plankton or as larvae? Well, it turns out they have these little bones in their head called otoliths, and oto meaning bone. And if you cut those bones up, you can count literal rings on them. And these first sets of rings right here indicate the number of days we think they spend in the pelagic larval duration or in the water column. And so for most species here in Hawaii, we're talking about 26 to 35 days. So it's about a month. Okay, now looking at coral reef fishes, what stage would this be right here? Okay, this is actually a fertilized egg. You can see in here, we've still got a membrane around it. We've got the eyes and the tail is curled around its head right there. So this would still be an egg stage, so very early on. Okay, what about this? Okay, this is definitely a larva. It's not an adult, it's not a juvenile. It's in the water column. Uh, it doesn't have a yolk sac. So if we're using the freshwater terminology, we'd say that it's a fry. It's, it's a larvae, but it's not a very early larvae because the yolk sac is gone. This in fact is a swordfish uh, larvae, which is kind of interesting. You see this big long pointy thing. Okay, what about this fish right here? So this fish is what? Again, we say it would be uh, a yolk sac larvae, or if we're using the freshwater terminology, we'd call it an alevin. So the yolk sac in most coral reef fishes is gone within a day or two. Uh, so this would be a very early on fish. This actually, I think, is a tilapia. Okay, then there's a crazy thing like this. So what stage do you think this guy would be? Probably gonna be a late larvae or a post yolk sac larvae. So if we're using the freshwater terminology, we'd call it, um, you know, a, a fry, right? So it's got these big long spines, but no yolk sac in there. And again, the spies are there to deter predation. Okay, then we've got something like this. What do you think this is? Is it a larvae? Is it a juvenile or is it an adult? If you said adult, you're correct. This is an adult uh, surgeon fish, Acanthurus olivaceus. It's got that little, you know, thing right here that looks like a pimento stuffed in an olive. That's how I can remember that. Okay, and what about the species right here? What do you think this is, this individual? Well, if you said it was a larvae uh, or a fry, you're actually wrong. Uh, this here is actually an adult fish, even though it doesn't look like it. It's a really crazy fish called Schindleria, and basically it's a fish that got rid of the adult phase. So instead of uh, settling out on the reef uh, as a juvenile and adult, it just stays in the water column its whole life. And these are actually eggs that it's producing. So that's how we know that it's a mature female. And we found out that these fish probably only live about 40 or 50 days. So some fish like Schindleria live very, very short lives. They're basically like gnats or mosquitoes. And then some fish on coral reefs like this uh, unicorn fish can live up to 50 years, some even more. So there's a very big difference on how long fish can live on the reef. Okay, and then talk about really cool life cycles. There's this goby, which is a little tiny fish like this that ends up as an adult up in the freshwater streams of Hawaii and then it spawns, the eggs get washed down to the sea just like they do, uh, well, other species. And those eggs develop into larvae, but the larvae hang out for about six months and then they begin to track their way back up the streams again. And then when they get to something like this, what would this be? This is a freaking waterfall. These guys actually climb a waterfall. How cool is that? A little bitty fish climbs up a waterfall just so it can spawn and make new little gobies. Okay, so if you're interested in fish or fisheries or anything like that, what can you do? Well, there are careers, for example, in aquaculture that is raising fish for food or sometimes raising them for uh, aquarium fish. Okay, depending on what you wanna do, it can require a degree, sometimes it doesn't, but it definitely requires that mentality of being able to raise things and, 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 and grow things. And I would be a horrible aquaculture person because I cannot keep fish alive in a tank. So if you can keep fish alive in a tank, maybe aquaculture is for you. Uh, another one would be ichthyology. 
Ichthyology is more of the study of anatomy and the number of species of fish that are out there. Uh, this is a very famous fish biologist who just passed away this month, Dr. Jack Randall. Uh, he described or discovered more than 500 and almost 600 species of fish, and that's more than anybody alive and probably more than anybody uh, in history. But he did this like looking under the microscope, being able to identify this fish or that fish, and wrote papers about them uh, to decide which fish were, were different species. So a really cool uh, career would be ichthyology, but that requires you get a master's degree or a doctorate, it requires lots of science, uh, as does marine biology. I kind of fancy myself as a marine biologist on the weekends and holidays. Um, you definitely get to do some cool stuff like diving, you get to do some spear fishing, a lot of lab work, a lot of grant writing, uh, but you need a lot of science, you need a lot of math, and you need a lot of uh, language arts too. So reading, writing, arithmetic, just like your teacher says, uh, those are the three things you're going to need to succeed in fisheries or in science in general.